Uh, before we get started, I did want to do a quick land acknowledgement. Um, we are currently seated on the traditional land of the Yali Tualatin, Wasco, Cowlitz, Clackamas, and Kalapuya. As we know, Indigenous people have played a very large role in shaping the world we live in today, so I want to make sure we acknowledge them before moving forward. And then as Rep Reynolds said, we have everyone muted at the moment, so we will have time for a Q&A. If you'd like to um, speak, if you could please turn your camera on and then use the raise hand function, and then we can unmute you. Um, but if you don't want to turn on your camera or if you just want to um, type in some uh, questions in the chat, feel free to do so. And now I will turn it over to Rep Reynolds to talk about the program. Great. So um, tonight we have a variety of things we're going to discuss. Uh, I'd like to give an update on what's going on with the Cottonwood School. I don't see that Kate is here yet. Is that right? Kate Sheriff's not here yet. Um, and then we're also going to talk a little bit about the Portland Children's Museum, which has announced that it's going to close after 75 years of enchanting children in Oregon. Um, I'll give some legislative updates and take a lot of Q&A. And then, um, uh, um, and then we have Rachel Prusak joining us. Uh, she's going to join at around 6.10, 6.15, and then we'll give an update on um, the gun violence prevention bills that are wending their way through the legislature. And so I'm really glad that you are all here. And here is Kate. Um, um, so I'm going to start. Thank you so much. And thanks for joining us on this, like, this spectacular day. I'm looking out my window. Uh, Pat. Pat, um, Pat certainly posted some beautiful pictures of Portland. It's been a really glorious weekend. I will say though, and, and Judy posted this on our Facebook, Judy, we are very alike. I'm like, ooh, I know we're all realizing that it's actually kind of problematic that it's 80 degrees in mid-April, that um, what this means in terms of our wildfire risks. And, um, and so just, it is, it is a little bit concerning. So we will try to still enjoy the weather while thinking about what we need to do to mitigate climate change. Um, so Kate, I'm actually going to have you kind of, if you could, I know a lot of people here probably know the story of Cottonwood School, but maybe not every single person does. So if you could tell the story a little bit and give an update, we're going to keep it pretty brief. Um, but Kate's been doing an amazing job as a school parent um, uh, on the Cottonwood School project. So Kate, if you could give kind of a brief background and, and where we are right now. Thank you, Kate. Thanks for being here. Wait, I think I have to ask you to unmute. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm like clicking the button. Nothing's <laughs> happening. I'm like, I'm such hopeless. a good host. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry, I was late. I was, I was on the wrong link. Um, so, um, yeah, I am a parent at the Cottonwood School of Civics and Science, which is located in the South Waterfront right next door to the ICE building. My daughter is a second grader there, and I have a four-year-old who will be a kindergartner in a year and a half. Um, and we've been really grappling with an issue of the use of chemical munitions at the ICE building, which has been impacting our school very seriously um, because we are right next door. So they we found a lot of actual munitions in our school playground. You know, um, we had a press conference on Monday and we had a display of all the munitions that have literally been picked up in our playground. Like it's not just nearby, it's landing in our sandbox, in our, on our playground. Um, and we're also very concerned about all the chemicals that may have soaked into the soil and into the playground surfaces um, that aren't visible and you can't pick up. And so um, just as a quick update, first of all, huge thanks to Lisa for all of her help and support on this. Um, Lisa has done some very visible things like writing a letter with Senator Burdick um, to DHS, um, really echoing the school's demands and calling for a complete end to the use of chemical weapons at this location. Um, but Lisa's also done so much behind the scenes to support me and help me in all the work that we're doing. So I'm just so grateful, Lisa, for your help on this. Um, and um, where we stand is that the school wrote a letter to DHS um, 11 weeks ago tomorrow. And the letter demanded that they stop using chemical weapons at this location, that they help us um, 
They tell us what munitions have been used. They haven't even shared any information with the school about what munitions they have used, which is just ridiculous if you think about it. Um, and so we're asking that they share the schools asking that they share that information, that they help us assess the damage and that they help us clean up. And uh, we haven't received a response from DHS. Um, in addition to the support from Lisa and Senator Burdick, um, our congressional delegation with the two senators and Representative Blumenauer and Representative Bonamici also letter, wrote a letter to DHS asking them to respond promptly to the school. And we have heard from Senator Wyden's office that they're working on a response. They, they're in touch with DHS at his office and they say that they will be getting back to us. But so far we have not gotten any response. Um, and we also have had great support from the Multnomah, Multnomah County Commissioners who also wrote a letter to DHS. Um, we have social media that we are working on trying to get the word out, although uh, we had a big press event on Monday and I was really tired because it was the press event was for the kids going back to school. The kids are back in school, but the playground is closed because we they did a lot of testing. They determined that the interior of the building was safe, but we don't think the playground is safe or I don't think the playground is safe for kids at this point. The school is being cautious. I'm glad the school is being cautious, but it is really sad that our playground is closed for now. Um, and the reason why we're not just replacing the soil and cleaning up is because until we get a commitment from DHS that they will stop using these chemical weapons, it's pointless. Um, I mean, it will just be completely undone the next time they use weapons and it gets recontaminated. So um, the school you know, is prepared to try to clean it up, although this is a lot of effort and expense at a time when we're already dealing with lots of expenses and time consuming planning around COVID with the school is doing so much for that. And so to have this added on top has made it even more challenging to go back to school. The kids are only at school in person two afternoons a week. So um, for now, they're only using the inside of the building or going on walking field trips and things like that. They're not using the playground at all. And um, I'll put the links to our social media in the chat so folks can follow along there. Um, we are just encouraging folks to continue calling our elected officials at every level of government, but especially the senators, because you know there are federal representatives and they're really gonna have um, the most direct lines of communication with DHS on this. Um, and hopefully that was brief enough. I know it was supposed to be No, brief. that was great. No, that was great. No, that was awesome. Thank you. Yeah. So, I mean, Kate has put in a ton of work on this um, along with some other parents and the director of the school. Um, and you said, thank you for the work or whatever, at least has been supportive. I really wish there was something I could do. It's tricky because this is all, it, this is ostensibly, it's a federal, these are federal agents. So it's really the federal delegation that we're hoping can make uh, some sort of impact on how this is going. Um, Kate's also done a nice job of engaging the South Water, no, the South Neighborhood Association, right? or South Waterfront Neighborhood Association. It's, it includes, the, it's the South Portland Neighborhood Association. So okay. it's like Lair Hill and John's Landing and South Waterfront. Right. Some of which is actually Southwest Portland and some of which is South Portland, but we won't get into the fifth yeah. quadrant, which of course. <laughs> and Oh, I should also mention, we have also been working with Reach Community Development, which yeah. is across the street from the school and they have been a great partner and ally. And I mean, another thing that we've been trying to do in our all of our efforts is to really lift up the fact that we know that as horrible as the contamination in our school is, it really doesn't begin to compare to the abuses that ICE inflicts on immigrant and refugee families. And so while we're struggling against ICE and this, this um, you know, problem, we don't wanna be taking away from or overshadowing that. We're trying to be in solidarity. So when we have phone scripts to call government elected officials, we always include a language around mentioning that you support, you know, fair and humane immigration reform and things along those lines. And we also right. use our social media to amplify folks working for immigrant justice. Right, and I do, you know, Kate, you mentioned the dirt, I think. I mean, this is a great playground because it is a dirt base. You know, a lot of playgrounds now are these, you know, crushed rubber where you could maybe envision, you could scrub that off. And, um, but this is dirt based for, for a good reason, right? This is, um, you know, we want kids to be doing experiential play and, and um, really be literally digging in the dirt. And so obviously if there's been munitions um, in that material that does not go well for kids. So it's just pretty heartbreaking that schools finally open after this year of so many losses and the kids can't play in the playground. Um, and that actually provides me a nice segue. Um, so thank you, Kate. If, if, does anyone have any questions for Kate? And I guess if you do, raise your hand or, or put it in the chat, because I'm trying to monitor all of this and I'm 
and I put I put those links in the chat yeah. and um I'm probably gonna hop off after this because I've been yeah I haven't spent enough time outside today but um I if you send like a Twitter DM or a Facebook message it'll get to me um if you don't already have my contact information so and, and yeah and I think you guys know social media really helps if all of us can like this page amplify when they're doing things um they had a great press conference on Monday with I think very good press conference both the Oregonian as well as was it coin I think it was coin I think news. we got covered on all the all the major tv networks they didn't all post it on their page but they were all there so that was great right. and I like I said I was so wiped out from the first week back to school and doing that event on Monday. I didn't do that much on social media last week to share it. So I'll be sharing all those stories probably this week. And it's a great chance for folks to share those um, on your own social media pages and help kind of amplify them. That would be great. Great. Um, thank you, Kate. I really appreciate yeah. it. Thank you so much, Lisa. I really Say hi appreciate to Esther all your help. And, and Henry. Yeah. I will. Okay, bye. Bye. Um, so this is a nice segue to um, another loss in our community. It keeps showing as Meta. <laughs> you keep, are you showing, you're showing up as the, as the person speaking, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back to the, I'm going back to seeing all of us to seeing um, individual people. Um, but there's been another, uh, another loss in our community besides the playground at Cottonwood School. And that is that about, um, boy, I think it's been about a month ago, although it feels like a long time ago, uh, the Portland Children's Museum uh, after 75 years of being um, a, a resource in Portland, announced that it was closing. That um, for a variety of reasons, including of course, including of course COVID, they couldn't see that there was a way to um, survive the economic downturn wrought by COVID. And I may even be saying more than they said because I will admit that when they announced they were closing, it was a pretty short and sweet statement. Uh, I have reached out and met with several of the board members as, long, as, as well as the interim executive director who took over in December when the previous like long-term director um, retired after many years of leading that institution. And the Portland Children's Museum is actually kind of an umbrella for four different organizations. It's the actual museum itself. It's the um, Opal School, which is a uh, Portland Public School charter school. It's a training program in the pedagogy of the um, Opal School. Teachers would come to learn about their curriculum and their method. And then it all, there was also a pre-kindergarten, like a preschool that was kind of related to the Opal School, but was, was a separate entity. So all four of those things are just shutting, um, shutting down starting in June. So as I mentioned, I've been meeting with um, board members of the Portland Children's Museum, the current, um, I said interim executive director, but there's no, there's no other side to the interim. <laughs> the, um, the, it, she was kind of a executive director brought in to see if she could write this ship. And they've all decided that they cannot write the ship. And I will be honest, I'm finding the whole thing really disappointing. Several legislators are working with me, including Senator Burdick, Senator Lieber, Rep. Graber, Senator Wagner, Rep. Salinas, Rep. Nose. I mean, a lot of us, um, have been meeting with members of the board. And, but, uh, but kind of like the Cottonwood School being run by a group of parents of the school, um, a Facebook group has grown up around this movement. And um, the Facebook group is called Help Save Portland Children's Museum. And they're up to three and a half thousand members. And it's a pretty robust group. I, I, I get on there a few times a week and I'm really um, moved by the work they're trying to do and also the stories that they're sharing uh, about bringing their kids to the Portland Children's Museum or even some people who remember being a kid at the Portland Children's Museum. And I will just say personally, one thing that strikes me about the Portland Children's Museum is, you know, first of all, it's a really was a really fabulous place for creative kind of um, make believe play. A lot of art supplies were there. And then at the end was the waterworks that we all said you would take your kids there at the end because otherwise they'd be soaking wet the whole day. Um, what it meant for me as a mom where I felt like I was always exhausted when my kids were younger was I could go there and I would often go with a friend and we would bring our kids or I would bring the newspaper <laughs> and I could sit and read and my kids were really happy doing wholesome, great stuff. So I think 
I, I'm only speaking for myself, but one of the things as, that I think about as a mom is like, it was a place where I could go and have a little bit of kind of quiet time for myself, but still with my kids and they were having a blast. Um, and that obviously was good for that too. Uh, but of course, more importantly, it was, it was a, it's a wonderful, wholesome place for kids to play. And it is a real loss, especially in a city where um, for a chunk of the year, not today, um, it's hard to spend a lot of time outside with your kids. So it was a great indoor place. Uh, at this point, I would like to turn it over to Elizabeth. I, I, so <laughs> Elizabeth, you, you look like you're in the witness protection plan. So Elizabeth and I talk on the phone at nine o'clock at night which is after her kids are in bed and after I'm done with session, uh, I'm often walking home through Salem talking to Elizabeth. So I've never laid eyes on her, um, but we've had a lot. Of, I'm really impressed with Elizabeth's uh, commitment to trying to do something to save Portland Children's Museum. And she speaks for this three and a half thousand people who um, care about this too. So I'm wondering, Elizabeth, if you, if you can give us an update on where you think things are right now. And I have to unmute you, hold on. Great. So, yes, yes. Hi, Elizabeth. Nice, nice to you. nice to meet you. Yeah, nice <laughs> to meet you finally. <laughs> um, sorry if it looks like I'm in witness protection program. It's a little backlit here, but most yeah. important is that you can hear me, right? Um, yeah, so thank you, Lisa. So yeah, so you gave a great summary um, of sort of where we've been and you know, and I can give you a little bit of update, hopefully, of where we're going. Um, so yeah, so this group, about three thousand something members right now. Um, we are mainly still working on public outreach. Uh, we are still hopeful that there's much to save, you know, even though the board obviously disagree with that. Uh, we have created um, a Slack group where we have working groups in them where different people focus on different things. So we have posted that in the Facebook group and we would love for anyone on this call to also join the group, of course and then join one of our working groups. That's a little bit more focused. Um, and as Lisa said, very limited communications with the board. They are very adamant about closing. I have been in touch uh, with the chair, um, but it's not really going anywhere. And one of the biggest problems um, our group is facing is that we know so little about the closure right, and why they're closing. Like we have no idea what happened in the last couple months, you know, or what led up to this, or even how they're managed, you know, the budget last year. So I have requested some uh, documents from them, some meeting minutes, um, and hopefully that will come through because that will give us a little more information, you know, sort of what our group can focus on and work on because we are not giving up just yet. We still have time, you know, it's slated for closure on um, end of June. So we still have, um, some time. Uh, and we are doing in these working groups that I mentioned earlier, we are working on a lot of different things. Um, I'm mainly focused on public outreach. Uh, we are also even looking for, you know, potential major donors that might be able to come in, you know, because if we do have someone lined up, you know, for the board, you know, it's possible that we can make, you know, a proposal to them that uh, they can say no to, basically. Uh, because as you know, they have mentioned to us over and over, you know, there are many complicated reasons, but as we know, unfortunately in this world with the right amount of money, usually, you know, we can get things done. Um, so who knows if we'll get there, perhaps not. Um, but another thing we also been working on is that we are uh, consulting uh, with nonprofit attorneys um, and we are looking to uh, do a small fundraiser for that, just so we can retain, you know, a lawyer and just, you know, basically look into our options to see if there's anything um, and we can do. And I should also mention, thanks to, you know, some of the art outreach we're doing, we are now in touch with uh, Senator Wyden and we are meeting with him uh, virtually, and him, no, not, I shouldn't say him, his team end of next week. And he and his team seems very supportive um, in learning more of what, you know, what we're working on. So we're hoping, you know, that we can get his support. Um, as Lisa mentioned earlier, there's a lot of representatives already that are, you know, I haven't heard anyone that's not, you know, interested in helping us uh, with this mission. So all those representatives that she mentioned, I'm hoping, you know, that we have their full support and more, of course. And we are working on a open letter to the board that we want to send to them, where we basically just talk about, you know, the importance and value of, you know, this museum, what it means to the community and, you know, over 250,000 people, you know, visiting each year. 
it's you know an important piece even you know as part of you know the economy Portland's economy um so yeah so this open letter where we talk about you know the importance of it and also um asking the board to basically re uh revisit you know their decision and see if they would revert it basically i mean that's obviously our angle with this whole um uh mission and then we're working a lot also with you know local media we have you know more stories hopefully coming out soon um because we really want to make sure the community is aware you know that this is happening and that there's still a chance that we can save this yeah. um so look for that and outreach continues and again if you can join that group that we have that would be fabulous you know that's the best way and our best bet for us to organize and actually have a chance to save this museum because we think it's worth saving and right. Lisa agrees right yeah yeah oh absolutely and actually so Elizabeth if you could type you know the handle or whatever the Facebook handle in the chat I think that would be helpful you know this is one of those things where um I um you know there are some issues with the building and we've known this for a while they have a lease that uh that expires in 2031 is that right Elizabeth so in yeah. 10 years and the building is is not a great building, and there's it would it would probably be a huge investment to to you know replace the HVAC system and all that. But I think that um, and obviously they're going to need a new site. But I think that that is something that could be things we could work on as a community. Um, I and uh, it's I think what bothers me almost as much as the museum closing is it just feels like there's a lack of transparency. And I've said this directly to the board and I will say it here. And I've asked them just meet with the community. You know, even if you can't tell people everything, you know, we understand, but there has been, um, there's been an unwillingness to meet with the community. Although Elizabeth did, were you, um, I think Elizabeth was, you have a meeting scheduled with the chairman, the chairperson of the board, right? No, I do not have a meeting scheduled. Oh, darn, we were hoping. Yeah, I know. Um, we He did respond to my last email, which is, you know, progress, in my opinion, right? Even if you get sort of, you know, a short response, that's it's better than nothing, right? Uh, but I am requesting some more records, which are sort of still pending. So there's still a chance that they will come through. Yeah. Because I agree with you. I feel like, yes, it's really sad, you know, the museum is closing, but I think if we would have known a little bit more about the reasons, then maybe, you know, we would all have been okay with it, right? But when you don't reach out for help for, you know, an entire year, and then suddenly, you know, you say, oh, we're closing, there, there's going to be, you know, a lot of upset people in the community, you know? So, yeah. so we would love to have that information if we could. And I have to admit, I envision that if if we if if all this effort leads to continued dead ends, and I think the effort is very worth doing, um, I think there will be an appetite uh, to to rebuild the Portland Children's Museum or some new phoenix out of the ashes, uh, maybe in a different location. And I think it'll be important to keep this movement going. Um, it does strike me that you know money doesn't solve every problem as. Um, as, uh, as, as tempting as that may be. So um, I'm really grateful for all you're doing, Elizabeth. I wouldn't, I would, you know, anyone who cares about the Portland Children's Museum, this is a really great Facebook group, grassroots effort. Um, and I'll certainly be updating folks as things move forward the next few months. So thank, thank you. Thank you also for your help. Because you've- Oh, I wish there's more I could do. Just like any of this, I wish there's more I could do. Um, yeah. And we'll keep, we'll keep talking once or twice a week at 9 p.m. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks. And does anyone have any questions for um, Elizabeth or any questions on this topic? I think we did a pretty good job at, at laying, laying down what's going on. Great. Um, well, thank you all. Now we're going to take a few minutes um, until Rachel Prusak gets here um, to talk a little bit about what's been going on in the legislature. And if you all have questions or concerns uh, that you want me to address in the next you know, 15 minutes or so, I'm, I'm um, monitoring the chat box um, and I'm trying to monitor the hands raised thing, but that's a little more challenging for me. Um, so, um, great. So, um, <laughs> Judy goes right for it. So, um, and, and Chris is here too. Chris, I may, I may allow you to comment on the redistricting committee as well. Um, 
So, you know, this is a little bit insider baseball stuff about what's been going on in the legislature. I know there are many um, uh, wonks here who are following this, and I know Judy is one of them and Chris is one of them. And I won't go into, um, oh, thanks. I, I won't go into too many details, but basically uh, the House Republicans in an effort to slow down our process, or as they would say, block our radical agenda. I, I can't remember the exact words. Um, they have been requiring us to read every bill out loud before we take a vote on the bill. One of those bills was 170 pages long. It took, I think, seven or eight, eight or nine hours to read. Um, other bills are sometimes one page long. But I will tell you, and, and I remember hearing this before I got to the legislature, and now that I see it in action, I really get it. Like most bills, and I want to say 96, 97 percent of bills go through with bipartisan support. And like a huge number of bills get 50 out of 60 votes, yes. So most, most, most bills are not controversial. You know, there might be a little bit of discussion on the floor, um, but of course there is, um, there's a handful of controversial bills and they say those are the ones they wanna stop. Although um, to be honest, the House Republicans have not come up and said, these are the bills we want to stop. What happened this week is a grand bargain was struck where the Republicans agreed to stop the reading of bills in exchange for equal representation on the redistricting committee. So every 10 years based on US census data, the Oregon legislature redraws the boundaries of US um, congressmen and state representatives and state senators. And it's done in a committee called the redistricting committee. And generally committees follow the same proportion of how many of how the representatives are in the body as a whole. So since we have, you know, not quite two thirds, we have, I guess, three fifths, almost three fifths um, uh, Democrats to two fifths Republicans, the committee was made up of three Democrats and two Republicans. But in the grand bargain, we agreed to allow a third Republican onto the committee. So now it's an even split, three Democrats and three Republicans. So um, it's, it's a mixed bag. The, the having to do 40 to 50 hours a week, uh, just on the floor, not including our other work, listening to bills being read was, I mean, we were all starting to feel a little bit ground down, some more than others. It was easier for me because my kids are off at college. It's harder for people whose kids were at home. And um, I would say that, you know, there's mixed emotions on, on what this means. <gasps> Look at that cute child. Hi. Um, so I'm, I'm easily distracted by cute children, by all children. Um, so anyway, it is what it is at this point going forward. I will say after that grand bargain was struck, like bills are like votes are coming up every like five or six minutes, which is great. But it's like, I had never had that happen before. So I actually, we had, Maida and I had a meeting schedule during this, like right when it switched over. And I was literally running from my office to the floor and back and forth. Um, I mean, Maida was running the meeting, so it wasn't that big a deal. And I had, didn't even change into sneakers and I should have. Um, and so it's just, a oh, there, <laughs> that's cute cat. So anyway, um, it's better. Uh, we're not spending as many hours in that room, which is important for COVID. Um, and we'll see what it means in terms of redistricting. If the committee cannot come to consensus on what they think the map should be for the next 10 years, then the redistricting process goes to um, Secretary of State Shamia Fagan, who I think that, I, my hunch is that the um, Republicans on the committee would rather that the legislature come up with the maps and not Shamia Fagan. So I think that will kind of keep them at the table and hopefully, um, Hopefully, come up with a good process. Did, Chris, did you want to? Am I going to put you on the on the hot seat? Do you want to comment at all about the process? Or Chris is um, Chris has uh, been advocating, along with many other people, for a completely different redistricting process where we have um, a larger consortium of people. Do you want? I'll let you describe it, Chris. As long as we're on the topic, I'm trying to ask you to unmute. Okay, yeah. thank you. I'll, I'll keep it to less than a minute. Yeah, there, there are alternative ways to redistrict and one is for an independent redistricting commission. 
And this was proposed in last year's IP 57, but it didn't make the ballot for certain reasons. Uh, but the dynamics, the dynamics are, as Lisa said, it's going to be an interesting session with an equally divided committee. Um, and I also agree with Lisa's assessment that the dynamics are the Republicans don't want this to go to the Democratic Secretary of State. So it'll, it, it's a hard job uh, the redistricting committee has, and they've, they'll have to come up with a plan in a special session by September 27th. So that's it. It, there are many issues in the legislature. This is just one. Good luck, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, great, great. I'm looking through. And Kathy and Judy, do you have any further comments you want to make on that? Here, let me ask you to unmute. Um, no, I think you covered it pretty well. I think they have a big incentive to stay at the table and not walk out. And that's huge for getting a lot of important legislation passed. And in 2011, there wasn't even split that redistricted and it worked out pretty well. Yeah. So I think the optics of this are good. Like the Oregonian praised it. Um, and Christine Drazen is the extra person on the committee as I understand. Well, she should have an incentive to make sure that it's logical and fair um, and not claim a mandate she doesn't have. <laughs> there will, um, <laughs> Judy and I were involved in a very, very wonky tweet where, I, where both Paul, Judy's husband and I were analyzing like how many people got how many votes and we just kept coming down to the conclusion is that, you know, um, you know, 58 to 63% of Oregonians you know, voted for the Democrats who are in the legislature. So um, I thought that was interesting. Yes, Kathy, wait, I need to ask you to unmute. Sorry, Kathy. Yeah, I just want to mention people may not be aware of it, but the likelihood is that Oregon is going to get a sixth congressional district, which will make the uh, congressional reapportionment maybe a little bit more interesting because you'll probably have a bunch of state senators and representatives who all want to move up to Congress. <laughs> Right. And they, they, they get to do the congressional districts. <laughs> right, right. And then my understanding, and Chris, feel free to correct me on this, is if uh, the legislative redistricting committees do cannot come to agreement on the U.S. congressional district borders, then it doesn't go to Shamia Fagan. It goes to um, a group of, someone said a group of retired judges. Is that is that right? Okay. So anyway, that's kind of interesting. So yes, um, someone did tell me though that like Oregon's been on, on the list to get a six seat for like, this will be the third decade. So not to get our hopes up, but if it happens, um, yeah. Um, great. So now, um, oh, hi, Damian Erland. I am going to ask you to unmute. Where are you? On? Oh, here you are. Okay, you yes. Hi, Damien. Welcome. We can't hear you. There, there, that sounds like we can hear testing, you. Testing, testing. Yes, yes, hi. Okay, cool. Um, I was just saying it's weird that Zoom makes you do uh, um, jump through all those hoops rather than just letting you unmute people, but setting that aside. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, well, not to bury the lead, specifically about star voting, but I noticed that you tweeted about it about 10 days ago um, about a Willamette Week article. So I wanted to ask you about that, um, what you think of it, and um, if you have any specific on the, uh, there's like a handful of bills right now that are on it, which are HB 3250 and HB 3241. I think there's a few more, but those are the two biggies. Yes, thank you for that. I will be... Um... I'll be honest, the reason star voting came on my radar is because my son Hank does the Willamette Week podcast and he interviewed um, Mark Fraunmeyer, who is, who is uh, who I guess invented star voting, is that correct? Or he helped? was, as I understand it, one of the main folks, but I, I don't think it was a one person invention. Yeah, uh, he's in with a group of people who really felt that um, elections are ripe for innovation. 
And the way star voting works, and I'm going to ask you to correct me if I'm wrong, Damien, is you basically, actually, can you describe it? <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's, uh, there's a couple of ways to describe it, but in its simplest form, um, it's a score and then ranking system. So if you have a whole bunch of candidates, you give them all um, zero to five stars, and those don't have to be exclusive. So if you really like two candidates, you can give them both five stars. Um, you add them up all the totals at the end, and then the top two um, have sort of an instant runoff where, let's say, candidate A and candidate B both got the most stars. If I scored candidate B higher than candidate A, then my vote goes to candidate B. Um, so it's a, a hybrid model that sort of takes rank choice voting and score voting and sort of gives the best of both, and throws them together. Yeah, so it, so it is, It is. I think, really interesting. It still feels a little too complicated for me, and I consider myself somewhat savvy, um, but it, it does come down to this, like, just choosing one person in an election. Well, first of all, it makes for primaries where the more extreme person comes out of the primary, um, which is why I think the Republicans in the legislature don't necessarily reflect even the Republicans in Oregon, although the Republicans in Oregon, a lot of them are um, are, are more extreme than I think they used to be. Um, and um, so there, that's one thing. And so, you, so I think in the end, the thinking is you would get more moderate people that, that tend to represent truly the, what the, you know, what the most Oregonians think and feel, and it feels more representative. So I know there are several bills working their way through their system. I, I haven't updated of where they are in the process. I know I looked at it a few weeks ago. Um, I think it's, they're in the rules committee, which means they, they don't have a deadline attached to them. But thank you for the question. I think it's really interesting. I, I suspect right now it's a little ahead of its time, but I wouldn't be surprised if this becomes the norm. There are some communities that are using star voting, right? Or at least ranked choice voting, which is different. Yeah, so ranked choice voting definitely has more uh, momentum. Um, star voting uh, is, well, it's relatively new. So it's like it was used in the Independent Party of Oregon in the last election cycle. Um, the Multnomah County Dems are using it now. Um, so it has some sort of uh, institutional usage in that way, but not in terms of like an actual government election yet. Um, yeah. So and I also expect that I don't expect probably any of the, the voting op, um, options to pass this session, um, which is why I would point you specifically towards HB 3241, which is just establishing a task force for the legislature to go look at those. Yeah, I think I think that's, that's a great idea. You know, I will admit, and I mentioned this um, in some of my correspondence with Chris, when you are, um, I mean, I'm going to be really honest. When you are the party in power, you're not super motivated to change things. <laughs> and I'm not necessarily speaking for myself, but, you know, this is certainly the culture there. Um, uh, you know, so I think... Uh, it's, it, it's, I appreciate that uh, speaking to the cynicism there, uh, to which I would point out, I think your point earlier about the extremity of the Republicans yeah. is a good counter argument to that. Because absolutely, if you absolutely. got rid of partisan primaries and you had a system that allowed multiple you know 10 candidates to run for one seat and get adequate rep adequately representative outcomes then i think you wouldn't have that issue anymore right and if we really had a you know a, a oregon house and oregon senate where it really felt like we were working together um and i will tell you again now that i'm there and i remember people would say this to me like you're you're kind of friends with these people and it is true you are you are friends with these people and individually you work together on projects but collectively it is super frustrating and i did have an instance this week where i kind of um maybe made it a little personal with one of my republican colleagues and then and then apologized um even though i was super frustrated they asked they they said the reading was going to the machine was reading too fast i was just like it was there's been a lot of time wasted on this and that is that is frustrating um and you know some people are saying that it this makes it tricky to do it just in oregon well especially if you're do i can't imagine we'd be able to do it in uh federal races for a while but um it would be interesting to try it and i think it might be that damien like people start doing it like portland city council does it and then um and then it kind of kind of rolls out across the street but but um very interesting and then i want to just um um, Timothy Rowan commented a little bit about 
um, oh, that's interesting that the Oregon law may, it's going back to the Portland Children's Museum, Oregon law makes board members individually liable for debts of the organization. Um, so um, uh, Elizabeth, shake your head and we won't get into it too much, but I will say that the Portland Children's Museum re has received a lot of money in this past year, including CARES funding. Um, and they, they are completely eligible for the American Rescue Plan Act money. I mean, they aren't now because they're closing. I mean, there is, I mean, as, as kind of grotesque as it sounds, there is money to be had. Um, but again, there's, sometimes there's only so much you can do it. Um, oh, Kimothy Culbertson um, asked a question that I do not know much about, which is diesel from general aviation airplanes or lead, I'm sorry, lead from general aviation airplanes. I have to admit, Kimberly, I don't know anything about that. I'm happy to look into it um, and uh, can, we can um, follow up on that. Will you make sure we write that down, Mita? <laughs> um, so great, good. Um, so I'm gonna just mention, if you guys look at Kat Wilson, she's drawing after every event that she joins us, um, uh, both the constituent coffees and the town halls, she sends me kind of like a, a pictograph of what, um, what happened in the event. And it's really, um, it's really charming and lovely. And I shared it with Rep. Ruiz after our uh, constituent coffee um, two weeks ago. So thank you, Kat. It's fun to see you drawing and knowing I'll be able to you know, get a personal version of that. Um, while we wait for, I'm just double checking. Um, um, Rep. Prusak will be joining us shortly. Um, I will, here she is. Hey, Rachel, I, Rep. Prusak, I have to, I'm going to unmute. You have to now unmute when you're ready. I have to ask you to unmute. This is our protective measure. Yes. How are you? Hey, everyone. I'm good. Good to see you all. Uh, thank you for having me. Yes. Thank you so much for being here. I will say, um, I think we all work hard in the legislature, but um, Rep. Prusak has had quite a lift this particular session. I, you know, I didn't, I didn't have a front row seat to how hard Rachel was working in previous sessions, but I can tell you she's working incredibly hard this session as chair of the House Health Care Committee. So we are now going to pivot, um, and you, you know, we have a, um, several moms friends here, uh, moms demand action friends here. But um, if we are going to pivot now and talk about the gun violence prevention bills, I'm just going to list the three that are kind of wending their way through the Oregon legislature, and then I'm going to ask, you know, I'm going to turn it over to Rachel to talk about um, where things are on that front. The Senate passed Senate Bill 554 which is a public buildings bill, which essentially allows public buildings, including schools, including, um, uh, and I'm sorry, state public buildings, schools and um, you know, state courthouses, the Capitol building, they will be allowed to ban guns because as it stands now, if you have a concealed carry permit, you can open carry a gun in those buildings. Um, so that, Pat, that was brought on by Senator Jenny Burdick passed the Oregon Senate and is now in the rules committee. Rachel, is that right? The Senate Bill 554? Okay. Then um, I'm, I'm gonna have to unmute you again. Where are you? Anyway, um, then um, we have the Charleston loophole, which a lot of you know well, which just allow, gives police law enforcement the time they need to complete a background check before a gun is released to a prospective buyer. And that is in the rules committee right now. It's kind of a parking lot. Um, and then we have the issue that's probably the most near and dear to my heart and I know to Rep. Prusak's heart, which is safe gun storage, which requires that guns are locked when not in use. So I am going to turn it over now to Rep. Prusak to talk about that or about where we are in all of this. Thank you. Um, so, um, we are in a place that everyone in the building knows 
that the House Democrats are prioritizing House Bill 2510. So for those of you that don't know, this is my third session um, trying to pass this bill. And I know Rep Reynolds um, was a fierce advocate on the other side. That's how we originally met. And so it's really great to have more advocates in the building with me, um, with Rep Reynolds and Rep Graber alongside um, Rep Solman. So, the plan is uh, the bill was originally carried over from last week to tomorrow. And the plan is for us to vote on House Bill 2510 tomorrow. I will say there's, um, um, you know, some talk about how we make sure we pass safe storage and public buildings. We all know that there's always a risk of Republicans walking out. And so we're being really um, strategic and um, ensuring that everyone knows how important safe storage is um, to those of us that have been fighting for it and those of us um, and uh, House Democrats. We did something very different with this bill this year. We um, hosted it, uh, the hearing and House health care instead of House judiciary, knowing that gun violence is a public health issue. And it was really fantastic um, to have us address it that way. It was, you know, an hour long of listening to gun violence survivors and physicians and nurses with data and uh, local uh, public health officials. One of the interesting things was I invited for the informational was the NRA and other gun uh, rights advocates to come and present what they do for safe storage as an informational. And they were very excited to be invited for that. And then when I had the public hearing, they of course came to testify in opposition um, because they believe that um, adults should make the decision on their own and, and, and it shouldn't be a law. Um, but I think, you know, we all know that uh, states that have passed a law that require secure storage, we have decrease in gun violence. And the reason why I've been fighting for it so long is the bill's named after a constituent of mine's um, who was killed in the Clackamas town shooting. So the goal is, after many sessions, is to finally get House Bill 2510 uh, safe storage across the finish line. And with all of your help, uh, we can do that. Um, and I don't know if you want me to maybe take a few questions that I can try to answer um, or go into detail about the bill, whatever you think is best. You know, we, this is a pretty savvy group of gun violence prevention activists, but you know, I, but, but I shouldn't assume because there are some new folks here. Why don't, can you give, yeah, the, the 10,000 foot, view or something about what the what the bill actually does. Sure. So obviously, yes, I'd appreciate sure. that. So it requires the most basic responsible practices for gun owners by requiring um, firearms to be safely stored. And if they're transferred, be transferred with a safe storage device and that they are reported when stolen. And it also requires that minors be supervised when using a firearm. So those are the big high level of what the bill does. And then it further goes into, you know, what is definition of control? What is approved um, storage device? Um, and what um, penalties uh, can come from that? And we really wanted to make sure that we didn't make anyone criminals and that we, we looked at it much more of uh, negligence to behavior with the hope and based on data know that while this won't remove all of the gun violence that we are up against in uh, this country, it will definitely move the needle and definitely save lives. You know, none of us are under the illusion that enacting a safe storage law will stop all the gun violence, right? But if we can even save, you know, <laughs> any life, it's worth it. Yes, and um, 
can you speak a little bit to the issue of uh, the problem of gun suicides, particularly in Oregon? Yes, let me pull up my statistics so I don't just say, um, so in Oregon, an average of 28 children and teens die by guns every year, and 69% of these deaths are by suicide. And if gun owners follow the law, minors would only have supervised access to firearms, and those deaths could be avoided. We had um, a doctor come and present, and I know with uh, Rep Reynolds being a pediatrician, also knows the data and statistic uh, well of the increased rate of suicide for our teenagers. It's the number one um, um, cause of death for that age group. And we also know that if you don't have access to a gun, but still tried to commit suicide, you're not successful and you go on to live a healthy life and thankful that you weren't successful. Yeah, no, thank you for that. I think that whole concept of means matter and, and we know that for a lot of people, um, the act of suicide can be an impulsive act. And if you don't have access to the lethal means, you will probably um, survive that. Um, it looks like Chris has his hand up. I'm gonna ask Chris to unmute. A uh, question for both of you. How far in the future is strict liability for firearm owners? I'm, I'm, if you understand the question, I'll leave it at that. I understand the question and strict liability is what's in House Bill 2510. So meaning that a gun owner is on the hook for damages if their firearm is accessed by an unauthorized user due to the failure to secure the firearm. And I, you know, in, in, in our bill, strict ability attaches when a gun owner fails to store a firearm, fails to supervise a minor with a firearm, fails to secure a firearm during transfer, fails to report it after 72 hours. Yeah, and it sounds like you know what strict liability is. Um, and there's lots of conversation around negligence versus strict liability um, when we were crafting the bill. Good, good question, thank you. Um, well, thank you, Rachel. I really, or Rep. Prusak. I really, um, it's been, uh, I, I, I have met um, Rep. Prusak through, you know, being a Moms Demand Action activist. I campaigned for her a few times. Uh, back when we could knock doors, that was two years or whatever, in 2018, and then phone banking in 2020. Um, but it's just, it's just such a thrill to be working with her on this. So we're really, um, we cannot wait to celebrate the passage of House Bill 2510. So thank you for being here. You are free to leave. I'm going to do a quick COVID update. I won't. I won't thank enjoy. you so much, everyone. And yes. thanks for having me. Thank you so much. See you tomorrow. Um, so I just want to do a brief COVID update, because what would a Lisa Reynolds event be without a COVID update? Um, uh, if you guys read my newsletter, and I'm sure you all read it very carefully, it came out Friday. I also had a newsletter on Monday, I had two newsletters last week. Um, and if you're looking at the newspapers or listening to OPP, you know that we are in the fourth wave of our COVID pandemic. And I looked again at, I look at the graph every two days and I'm a little bit, it's, it's pretty scary. The slope is going up pretty high. Our R1 number, um, I think there's another name for it, kind of the replication number is up to 1.4. That means for every person who has COVID, they give it to 1.4 people. And that's why we're seeing such a big uptick. R, is it R0, I think, or R0? Rob's trying to help me with this. Um, so, um, so this is bad. And that's among the highest replication numbers in the country. And granted, our numbers are still lower than the national average, quite a bit lower than the national average. But boy, I wonder if the rate we're going, if we're going to reach the national average. And I think this is an indication that we have um, a, a larger percentage of our COVID cases are due to variants, which are, you know, 20 to 40 to 50 percent more contagious. Um, but I will tell you, the vaccines are awesome. Out of uh, the, the numbers last week was 700,000 vaccinated Oregonians and 120 cases of COVID among those. There were six deaths among those and that's tragic, um, but the vaccine really, really works. Um, so I would encourage you guys to keep, you know, putting your precautions in place, get the jab as soon as you can. And I think we need to ring the alarm. I will admit, and I said this in my newsletter, I'll say it here. I am disappointed that we are not tightening our restrictions 
And the argument for that is because we're not seeing um, as much of a high of a rate of hospitalization, um, we, aren't worried, we aren't worried yet about our hospitals being overwhelmed, which is what caused us to per, put the restrictions in place to begin with. And that's in part because fewer older people are getting COVID because ostensibly they've been vaccinated. Although apparently in Grant County, is it Grant County? They really aren't, the older people are not being vaccinated. They're, they're vaccine skeptics, but anyway. Um, but I, you know, so I have a family in my practice. They all got COVID. Their mom is in her early forties and she is so sick. She was hospitalized for two days. She's home now. She's actually with her own mother because she felt she couldn't even figure out how to help her kids at all. And it was like really difficult, even though her kids all have COVID and they're fine. So what's going to happen is as these case counts go up, we're going to start hearing, it's just, it's just a math issue, right? We're going to start hearing about younger people either having severe disease or dying or becoming what we call long haulers. So I am arguing for a um, return to the restrictions. And I think these restrictions, thank you, Cheryl, these restrictions are made, and I, this is a pun, these restrictions are made a little bit more palatable. And I say that because we're talking about restaurants and bars, um, because the federal government it, it has released billions, I can't remember the number, billions of dollars in the Restaurant Act to help restaurants whose bottom line have been so harmed in the COVID pandemic. They're basically saying, we will give you the difference between the revenue you made in 2019 and the revenue you made in 2020. And I think we'll have to also add 2021 to that. So there is a lot of help for that. Um, Pat, and Dave, Pat or Dave asked about monoclonal antibodies. Apparently, I, I don't know what the status of that is right now. I know that the plasma has been shown not to be super helpful, but I do think the monoclonal antibody treatment, as far as I know, is very, very scarce and hard to get. Um, but it's a great question. Like, have we, I mean, after this whole year, which has been amazing to see how we've invented a vaccine, how we've really ramped up our infrastructure to deliver you know, over 700,000, well, more than 700,000 doses. I think it's 1.2 million doses in Oregon alone, um, doing three and a half million doses across the U.S. This is like equivalent to when like, equivalent but simpler than when we had, you know, when we had to build all those ships for World War II, including in shipyards here in Portland. But um, it's, it's pretty exciting. So, um, so I think we've been all distracted by that. But the reality is right now, Pat or Dave, <laughs> that um, I think our treatments for COVID are still, we learned a lot in those first six months, but there hasn't been a lot of innovative changes in how we are actually able to treat COVID. It's still, let's support you until your body's able to fight this off. So it's, it's a very bad disease. Um, I wanna thank you all for spending some time with me on Sunday. It's so nice to see you all. Uh, you know, you can reach out to me anytime. Um, <clears throat> if I hear anything more about the monoclonal antibodies, um, I'll certainly let folks know. Uh, tomorrow, every Oregonian 16 and older becomes eligible for the vaccine. I'm sure that the scheduling software will crash again because <laughs> this is a huge influx of patients into the system. I will say that the drugstores, thanks Rob, the drugstores are a good, a good spot. This is all in my newsletter and in my social media and we'll be reposting all of that tomorrow. Uh, if you have a 16 or 17 year old that you love and want, want to get vaccine, they have to get the Pfizer. And I'm not exactly sure how that, I haven't figured out yet how that works to be able to um, verify that you have access to Pfizer vaccine for that age group. My pediatric clinic is trying to get vaccine. We'll be vaccinating at our site as well. If you are personally having problems getting an appointment, please reach out to us. And there is this amazing Vaccine Hunter Facebook page, Steve Dwin, how do you say his name? D-U-I-N, wrote about it. I've been following this Facebook group. It's super fun where the vaccine hunters will tell you like, there's 50 appointments at Walgreens, you know, and then everyone goes and, you know, but it's actually, if there's, if you're looking for a, a jab, that's, that's kind of a, a place to look and just kind of a fun community to, um, to see how they're doing. It's kind of sad we need independent vaccine hunters. It's because the system is so overloaded. 
But thank you again for being here this evening. It's such an honor and pleasure to see you all. And I know I represent a lot of you, but maybe not all of you. Uh, reach out for anything um, and, uh, and let's keep doing the good work and keeping our eye on the prize. And I think a lot will happen. I mean, tomorrow will be a really interesting day when it comes to gun violence prevention. I know Judy for sure will be watching and probably some others too. And as soon as I know more, we'll be posting on social media. Okay, thank you all very much and have a lovely evening.